All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Kalamazoo Venture Tuesday. Everyone, do me a favor and please uh, mute your microphone when you're not speaking, but do feel free to leave your camera on so we can see smiling faces. For those of you who have never joined us before, Kalamazoo Venture Tuesday is an opportunity to see inside the mind of investors as they provide feedback to company presenters. The purpose of KVT is not to secure immediate investment, but rather it's a teaching opportunity for participating companies and for members of the audience. Each of our quarterly meetings features a panel of three active investors and three startup or early stage companies. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to pitch, followed by 10 minutes of feedback and interaction with the investor panel. We do not take questions from the audience. However, the audience, you may ask a question or make comment in the chat, and that's located in the conversation bubble at the top of your screen. Our presenters today um, in order of appearance are going to be Bob Forge with Iaso Biotherapeutics. We're going to have next Adam Koster with Interactome Bio and last Joseph Yelmacher of Electric Outdoors LLC. And in order to get started, I'm going to ask our esteemed panel of investors to introduce each of themselves. So, um, Jim, can you go real quick and say hello and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Jim Tenzillo. I'm the managing director of Invest Michigan, uh, co-founder of a community of VCs across the country called Venture Next, and founding partner of the Venture Next Midwest Fund. Awesome. Thank you, Diane. You're with Michigan Capital Network. Say hello. Oh, wait, you're still muted. Hmm. I was double muted. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm Diane Durant. Good morning, everyone. I'm president of Michigan Capital Network Association, and we operate uh, five angel groups around the state of Michigan, including Grand Angels, Blue Water Angels, Kazoo Angels, Woodward Angels, and Flint Angels. And our group represents about 150 investors. Excellent, thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have Hugo Braun with North Coast Technology Investors. Hugo, say hello. Good morning. Um, uh, I'm with uh, I'm Hugo Brown with North Coast Technology Investors. We're a, a venture capital firm based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Great, thank you very much. Okay, and with that, we are ready to go. I see Bob Forge has his slides up. He is ready. Bob, can I hear you? Let me test your mic first. Yep, testing. You're perfect. Okay, well, we are gonna get kicked off whenever you are ready, Bob. I've got my timer going. You keep an eye on your time as well, and your time will begin whenever you begin. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Well, good morning, everyone. It's my honor to uh, present to you IASO Therapeutics. It's our, we are a vaccine discovery and technology development company uh, that seeks to enhance health and wellness with the next generation of disruptive vaccine technologies. Why vaccines? Um, vaccines are a highly effective and cost-effective way of improving human health. Um, in the past, vaccines have increased in increased global health and public health, increasing life expecting expectancies and preventing an estimated one and a half million deaths per year. In the future, it's predicted by um, epidemiologists that vaccines are going to play a more important role in addressing emerging pandemics, uh, addressing the spreading issue of multidrug resistance in bacteria, and, you know, and it's a very cost-effective um, way of investing healthcare dollars. For every dollar spent, you get a 45-fold return on investment. Let me tell you a little bit about our technology. We have a camp, we work in the realm of conjugate vaccines, meaning that we take an antigen that, that is associated with a disease and display it to the immune system by chemically co connecting it to a carrier. This technology is based on work done at Michigan State University in the labs of Dr. Shufei Wong. The company was organized in 2018 when patents were filed in the US, Europe, Japan, China, and Singapore. We have been awarded $2.3 million in SBIR grants from both the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute and the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And 
Uh, we're currently raising a $1.25 million seed round. I'll talk more about that seed round later in the presentation. In addition to the grant funding and the equity funding we're, we're bringing in, the company has a sponsored research agreement with a major pharmaceutical company. We're working on vaccines of their interest and we are selling our product into the non-commercial research arena using a distribution partner. Why new conjugates? We have competition out there. Um, conjugate vaccines are the leading market and are projected to have the highest relative growth rate among all vaccine types. Um, in the question and answer, we can go into the various types of vaccines if you're interested. Um, vaccines seek to increase the immune response of an antigen on a pathogen or something that causes disease. But bacteria, viruses, co-evolve in the presence of our immune system and they seek to evolve to evade um, our own immune system. So we have to find ways to promote the antigen presentation that's unusual and has a higher activation of the immune system. Oops, sorry. So let me tell you a little bit more about our technology, which is here in the center. Mutant Q-beta forms a particle of 30 nanometers, and through a chemical linker, we can connect an antigen, something associated with a disease, to that carrier. We can do that process up to 900 times per particle. Why is that important? If you look at these antigens by themselves, they do interact with the epitope or the receptors on the surface of the B cell. And the result of that is low titers of a low affinity type of antibody called IgM. On the other hand, if we put our mutant, the antigen on our mutant Q-beta, we get a pattern of display. And that pattern of display uh, helps to cross-link the receptors, causing a cascade of signals and the release of cytokines that recruit helper T cells and result in the production of a high affinity um, antibody of a different class of ant antibody. In addition to the um, antibody for portion of the immune system, we also activate both Th1 and Th2 um, T cells, which are important for the helper and the cellular components of the immune system. Let me show you some of the data in just a couple of data slides. If we take an antigen of interest and connect it either to our Q beta or another carrier, we routinely see three to tenfold higher antibody production. If we follow that antibody concentration out over up to 600 days, we see that we maintain a very high level of protective immunity as compared to, in this case, KLH. Persistence of the um, vaccine is very important, and you, you can see that in the Moderna Pfizer um, COVID vaccine, where we're looking at every six months and possibly a year. So a longer duration vaccine is important. All right. One last piece of data. Um, we have excellent anti-cancer and preclinical models. Here we take an antigen associated with cancer, inject it into a mouse, and here we're looking at the production of um, antibody specific to that antigen, and this is the negative control, which is just the Q beta particle itself, showing that we don't get an antibody production against the antigen of interest. In the right-hand panel, what we're seeing is here again the antibody or the vaccine containing the antigen of interest showing C -tel, C T cell activation, excuse me, but that the naked particle itself does not cause that result. I have more data if we want to dive into data that I can cover in, in follow-up questions. Let's kind of do a competitive comparison of the, the, the commercially important um, carriers. So PRIM197 is a genetically modified diphtheria toxoid. This is tetanus toxoid, and this is keyhole lymphid hemocyanin. These all are, all of these four are expressed, are, these two are expressed in E. coli. These two are chemically modified um, and isolated from fermentation of these pathogens. 
this is isolated from natural sources. Mutant Q-beta has uh, ease of manufacturing because it is fermented in E. coli. There's a homogeneity of its carrier. I've shown you that it ge generates high antibody titer. We can, we can continue to genetically modify this and, and improve upon it if we need to. It does have a part, uh, a feature where it actually causes self-adjuvant. An adjuvant is something you would include in a vaccine that super stimulates the immune system. And the messenger RNA associated with our particle from the E. coli stimulates the immune system in a positive way. And I've shown you data that shows that we have persistent antigen-specific antibodies that last up to 600 days in the data I showed you. Um, our business model. So we have an exclusive license for all uses of the mutant, mutant Q-beta technology from MSU and the inventors. We have additional grant funding and we will um, continue to seek that for early stage research to um, establish proof of principle. We have sponsored research and venture funding will support um, early commercialization efforts. And then we'll do out license and direct sales of the, the technology to fund you know, third party development. This is uh, AISO's current portfolio of products. We have two prophylactic antibacterials, one against pneumonia and the other against uh, forms of salmonella. The third product is what the company was based on. It's for the furthest uh, developed is a, a therapeutic against breast cancer. Kind of showing you a Gantt chart at a very high level. Our current funding, which includes grants and the Series Seed, will take us to the pre-IND money, IND meeting with the FDA. We'll seek to raise a Series A subsequently that will take us from the pre-IND meeting through IND submission and completion of phase one first in human studies at which time we'll have to raise, potentially raise a Series B to get to clinical proof of concept. What are we asking for? We are seeking a Series C preferred round of 1.25 million. That, that investor pool has a 1x liquidation preference. The pre-money valuation of the company is 3.75 million. And what I'd like to also highlight to the investors are that we have an NSF phase two which qualifies us for a phase 2B, which means that for every dollar raise, I get a 50 cents up to a million dollar raise. So there's a half million dollar grant at, uh, on the table, and that's why we're trying to raise just north of $1 million. The use of proceeds will be principally um, R&D and G&A, and then corporate and patent, legal patent. I am Robert Forge. I'm the president and CEO. I, this is my fourth startup in Michigan, uh, dating clear back to 2004. Prior to that, I spent nearly 20 years in large pharma. Uh, professor Shufei Wong is the uh, founder of the company. He is a full professor in the departments of chemistry and biomedical engineering. He is a AAAS fellow and American Chemical Society fellow. Dr. Herbert Kanbuja is the chief scientist at IASO. He was trained in Professor Wong's lab and his doctoral work was on the um, mutant Q-beta. Our board of directors, which was in place at the first closing of our series seed is Mr. Don Parfait. He's the managing director of the Apshon Group. Um, which works on commercialization of life science technologies. Mr. Jeff Wesley, who is the executive director um, at Spartan Innovations. He's also leads Red Cedar Ventures and Michigan Rise Venture Funds. Dr. Steve Kimmerly um, is our independent board member. He has three decades of healthcare um, development experience, uh, culminating in leading uh, the venture investment arm of I Abbott Pharmaceuticals, where he sought to end license um, enabling technologies and drug opportunities. Um, of course, myself and Shufei are on the board as well. And at that point, Sandra, I will stop. 
Okay, thank you. Yes, you're about two minutes over. So we're going to have a little shortened uh, Q&A time, but we're going to jump right in. Jim, I'm going to ask you to go first. What's your feedback for Bob today? First of all, great presentation. Um, you know, I, I would say just one uh, constructive piece of feedback. It, it took a few slides to get to the differentiation, which is uh, longer immune response time and, and uh, higher effic efficacy, it seems like. Uh, I would move that, you know, right, right in the beginning, um, you know, kind of jump right in on the second or third slide on on how you're different, because uh, it it was kind of buried there a little bit. But other than that, I thought it was great. Uh, the only clarifying question I had too on that timeline, uh, you talk about uh, getting to, um, you know, getting through clinical trials. I wasn't it wasn't clear to me if that's just for breast cancer, if that's for all the other indications as well. I, 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 Thank, thanks, Jim. I appreciate the comment. Yeah, I, to get into the why are we different, I always w wonder how much I need to set the table before I and, and give a background so people understand what we're doing before we tell them why we're better. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll, I'll see how I can weave that in. Uh, with regards to the clinical development, as a small company on four, four to seven million dollars, we're only going to be able to take one opportunity into the clinic. Mm -hmm. Um, even though the Buck one cancer asset is the most advanced, um, I believe, and I'm going to make the recommendation to the board for their endorsement, that cancer is probably a higher risk profile for a powerful platform like this, and that we should probably take one of the infectious disease assets in. Now, pneumonia, there are already some very large players, Merck, GSK, Pfizer, who have annual pneumonia um, vaccines, and it's a very crowded field, and we're a very small company. It may not be the best to go into a highly competitive, highly um, saturated market, even though we do believe we could have a novel approach there. Um, so it's highly likely we'll take the salmonella forward because there are salmonella vaccines out there, but not for the three species we cover. So we believe that we could get to an early um, indication of efficacy in our phase one humans clinical trials. I'm working with Dr. Jack Luter, who is an executive in residence at Michigan State um, Spartan Innovations, and he's trying to help me um, to develop the clinical endpoints, the biomarkers that we could establish human efficacy as early as the phase one. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think it'd be great to include that somewhere, probably in that timeline slide. Okay, Th thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, we're going to put you on next. Well, what are your thoughts for Bob? Well, for one thing, I was really intrigued by your uh, risk uh, slide that we didn't actually get to see there at the end, but that was very, uh, very, very uh, wise of you to kind of give us that fleeting, fleeting look at it. Um, I really liked your presentation. I thought it was very clear. I am not a uh, biologist by any means or chemist. So um, to look at those, uh, to look at a company like yours, it's very difficult for me to, to know where you stand vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other companies that we hear from that are doing similar research. But there were some things that just really jumped out at me, and one was your background with PRONI and ONL, which makes me uh, curious, and maybe you could work this into your presentation a little bit, on, on why you believe so much in your current um, uh, company and how the, the uh, successes you had with the other companies position you really well to commercialize this and take it forward. There's a lot of credibility there and your board of directors as well with Don Parfett and Jeff Wesley. Um, that gives you a lot of credibility, certainly in the Michigan entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem where we all know those folks. So I would maybe um, name drop a little early earlier on in the presentation so that you are already positioned in the uh, the investor's mind as an expert that has had success and is very familiar with this environment and has attracted um, a stellar board of directors that would not be wasting their time on this if it were not a real solid opportunity. Thanks, Diane. And I love Thanks. this. I love this slide, so I'm glad to <laughs> glad to see it there for a second. 
Yeah, and and, and I, I can address it um, if we have time after I answer Hugo's in questions or listen to his feedback. Sure, and we are going to move on. And Hugo, um, what would you like to say to Bob? So again, uh, nice presentation. Um, I do have a variety of different types of uh, feedback. Um, <clears throat> picking up on what Adam said, I think about the uh, slide that had the um, you know, the bars about the pre IND meeting and the IND and it was, you know, he's asking well, what is that for exactly? I would go one step further and say that's a pretty busy slide. Um, what you probably really want to uh, articulate there is this financing that we're raising is specifically to achieve this milestone, which you described the milestone pretty detailed. I mean, or just very specifically, mm -hmm. you know, and so because uh, I do think obviously that's a, you know, valuable uh, and I, I thought that was a little complicated um, okay. in terms of the you know presentation aspect of it. Um, with the overall uh, approach, you know, you described at the beginning that it's a, essentially a platform technology. Um, in addition, you talked about specific disease you know targets, um, and there's uh, you know it's it's a challenging balance. I think you know what's what is your you know, product, what's your main focus? Is it a platform or is it a product? And whether it's partners or investors, they're going to try to evaluate, you know, which, what do you, what are we funding here? Are we funding a cancer vaccine or are we funding a broad based platform that could be applied to a whole bunch of things that we're going to partner with a whole bunch of people? And I know the temptation is to say both. Um, but I do think it's, it's, um, it's important to, you know, to try to, to clarify that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the steps necessary, like if it was going to be a cancer vaccine or if it was going to be a salmonella vaccine, you'd want to say things like, here's the current uh, market for those and here's how we fit into that market. If a cancer vaccine is actually your product or if it's sal salmonella, you didn't mention any of those things. Again, not, not really a criticism. I'm really just throwing out ideas here. Mm -hmm. um, but if you were to be perceived as a cancer vaccine company, then especially if it's a breast cancer vaccine company, you know, a specific vaccine, you really do want to, uh, I think, say how do you, it's, it's less relevant how you compare to other, um, you know, platforms and more relevant how you, your, your end product compares to the other end products out there. Fair, yeah. If it's a, if it's a platform technology, um, then I think you you know you did a really nice job. That's what you really presented, which is here's our platform, here's how it compares to other platforms, here's our advantages. And I thought that was you did a good job with that. Um, you also mentioned just sort of off to the side, and we're going to sell some material to other people. We already are. Right. That sounded intriguing, but obviously you didn't say anything at all about what that was or how how no, no, is, mean, that, is that is that important or is that not important? Pardon me. You, you don't have time in 10 minutes, but yeah, yeah, yeah it's just to, to, to address that. We have a distribution in Fina Biotechnologies, which sells all of the competitive um, carriers. Right, uh, but we, would that be, I, again, my primary question isn't so much the detail as, is that an important part of the business plan or is that really just sort of a extra thing you can do that's not really very important? Um, it's an extra thing that we can do. It's not important except in getting our technology into the hands of other researchers so that we have um, other people publishing in good quality journals showing the utility. So that's the exact, that's the kind of point I would make about that activity, you know, it, which is very brief, but you kind of said, hey, here's a real value add for that. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly why I'm having that loss leader. Yeah, good. All right. Well, thank you. Wonderful job, Bob. Very interesting and very nice insights from our panel. Go ahead and uh, stop sharing. And Adam, we're going to get you going because you're next on, on the agenda. Here, I to make sure I can get the screen share going. Yeah, thank I can hear so you. So that's good. Hang on. We're not seeing the screen yet, but I can hear you. Yeah, I don't want to start the time till we have everything up and running. Can you see my screen? Nope, not yet. Hmm.
Can I give one more piece of feedback on the last one? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Just I would say you mentioned sponsored research, and that's yes. both great and potentially limiting as to what the future can hold financially. And so I would say if you decide you want to mention that, you might want to mention why you don't think that's going to unduly restrict you. Now, I, I can tell you because we have a portfolio of mutants, one, so I can license different mutants to different um, sponsors. And um, alternatively, I can limit the license to a specific antigen and use. OK. Sounds sounds good. I would good. mention it. OK, Thank thanks, you. Hugo. Wonderful. Thank you. And that gave um, Adam the time he needed. We We now see the screen. And are you? Unmuted. Yep, you look unmuted. And oh, wait, there we go. Okay, guys. Sorry about the technical difficulties. And we're good to go whenever you are. Okay, great. Thank you, Sandra. Very happy to be here this morning. Our company is Interact Home Bio. I'm the CEO and co founder with my partner at the bottom. You can see Dr. Amit Fadil. And actually, our first board member is a very exciting time for us. We had our first board meeting two weeks ago, which is very interesting. You start to feel like a very real company. Uh, and we just ratified the rest of our medical and scientific advisory board. So you can see Ken and Ahmed uh, published this paper all the way back in 2008. It was the first time the word interactome appeared in the literature. And that'll be important coming up as we learn a little bit more about our platform technology. <clears throat> little table of contents. And re it's really important here to focus in on the problems facing the field right now for nanoparticle technology and development. We're specifically in a space, uh, a nascent space called extracellular vesicles, more specifically exosomes. But within the field of exosomes, which essentially are these little nanoparticles that you see here, I found it interesting, Robert talking about his viral uh, technology around 30 nanometers. Exosomes typically are around 30 nanometers up to 150 nanometers. And that makes them very, very difficult to work with because they're extremely small. If you were to put a cell on the table and put an exosome next to it, uh, that cell would be a quarter and you wouldn't be able to see the exosome. So the scale here makes these nanoparticles extremely difficult to work with. However, having the surface, you can see uh, this plasma membrane, just like this cell here, is crucial for the activity, bioavailability, and really functionality of these nanoparticles, which are endogenous. So uh, obviously you can see the uh, points here, numerous um, means to commercialize these nanoparticles in the market right now. Uh, we're interested actually on the back end in being a, not just a contract manufacturer, but actually with some early products that we've developed and are commercializing in 2023, which we'll get into more detail here shortly. This slide again, just faces the big problems facing the field right now. Uh, even though we're leaving nascent uh, just right about now, these are the major problems facing uh, exosomal medicines, which the biggest one relates to scalability. So within the cell and gene therapy domain, cell therapies have been king. We'll go into that in another slide upcoming. But there's been a major paradigm shift now to acellular technologies because cells are highly unpredictable. But again, with these nanoparticles getting scalable batch to batch uh, consistent subclass specific doses of exosomes, meaning every single cell in your body releases these nanoparticles into their native environment. <clears throat> so when you have billions and billions of cells releasing trillions of nanoparticles, the heterogeneity and the diversity of the cargo, what's inside these particles, but also the proteins on their surface and how they function, really uh, you can't commercialize a product or attempt to uh, do drug development without bioinformatics uh, and a scalable closed system that can produce scalable batches. <clears throat> also, this goes into some of the other intellectual property uh, highlights that we have around loading of these vesicles, uh, some upstream technology on the bioreactor side, as well as downstream. Clearly, uh, I said before, it, it, we've kind of been nascent, but now we're really leaving nascency uh, with some very massive deals occurring over the last couple of years. Again, a company pulled out of an IPO to take a billion dollar deal with Jazz Pharma <clears throat> and has actually recently fell apart, unfortunately, due to not hitting some uh, major endpoints. You can see uh, there's just been an explosion 
uh, not just in the literature, but on the the capital investment side. Uh, for me myself, back in 2009, I gave a presentation as a part of my master's thesis at Central Michigan University, and I had all the department heads approach me after the, the presentation and say, hey, we'd like to do this research at, at the university. At that point, I knew I was on to something, uh, left the bench shortly, uh, a short while later, and a few years later joined the first commercial company marketing a topical exosome product for aesthetics. I was able to take that company from about 50,000 in sales to 25 million in sales in just under two years. And as you can see, my partner up top, uh, exosomes have been very interesting in terms of what's happened retroactively. Uh, around the 80s and 90s, major journals, Nature, Science, Cell, were really all rejecting papers about exosomes because it was well thought that exosomes are just really a waste mechanism for the cell, a way for them to get rid of garbage. <clears throat> My partner, however, thought differently and persisted with his work and publications, and we've taken a lot of that IP, added on to it with additional add-on filings, and uh, developed now this core platform for scalable uh, sterile production. So you can see the evolution of our relationship, the founding of our IP holding company in 2016, as well as our operating company, Interact Home Bio, just a, uh, a few years ago in 2020. Some milestones we've hit, um, about to close out ISO 9001, which is a very big deal for us. We've built out inside the West Michigan Innovation Center, proof of concept manufacturing uh, under ISO 7 uh, clean room sterile conditions. <clears throat> and last November, we signed a major big pharma partnership with the third largest company globally in aesthetics, botulinum toxins, fillers, et cetera. <clears throat> we've received seven figures in upfront capital. Uh, to develop a handful of products for a very well-established skincare brand, essentially where we're engineering exosomes for skincare. <clears throat> we are cash flow positive as of just a few weeks ago, which is very exciting after grinding it out now for a little over three years. And you can see some of these other major organizations in the space. This dives a little bit deeper into our deal with our major pharma partner. Um, again, we have 11 total patents, uh, seven of which my partner and I have drafted and filed together, and six of which are highly relevant for the purposes of our project with our, our major partner. We are planning, uh, hopefully, to get acquired in this first operating company as we look to hit major milestones uh, for what we see coming down the pipe. <clears throat> this slide really dictates uh, where we're at. Um, our platform technology, our current raise, we're raising $2 million in our current round. We've hit half that uh, and just uh, recently signed on a, a gentleman um, who at one point uh, owned and operated the largest uh, Stryker distributorship and sold that back to Stryker a few years ago uh, for $80 million plus. Very excited to have him on our board and also as an investor. And you can see uh, from a business risk production uh, reduction perspective, uh, we really knew early on, uh, not only because of my commercial background and in, in helping to generate the market for cosmetic exosome products, um, that if we were really going to build a scalable CGMP contract manufacturing facility for cell and gene therapy, <clears throat> we need to revenues early. So we've signed this deal with our major partner, but we've also developed with the same platform our own cosmetic exosome product and signed a global distribution agreement in Asia, Australia, <clears throat> and parts of the Gulf Coast countries. We've also developed uh, in tandem a very similar product um, where we have about uh, just under $3 million of business acquired, a product called Placental Tissue Matrix, uh, where we've been well established for over 10 years. <clears throat> As you can see, this is a slide I, I touched on earlier. There's really a major paradigm shift happening in cell and gene therapies, over 1,700 organizations and clinical trials, 40% of these trials being placed on clinical hold. We knew very early on that our system, our platform was the most crucial aspect of our technology. And we've spent over four years uh, you know, on the patents, developing the system. We have a, a partnership with AMDI, who has a private public partnership with Grand Valley State. We get to leverage all of their prototyping, 3D printing, graduate students in our system where we're essentially combining microfluidics, nanofluidics, and immunoprecipitation to elute out the results that we touched on prior. 
our team, um, <clears throat> we have an elite team of advisors, board members, uh, Melanie Palm, one of the top dermatologists in the country, as well as Greg Chernoff, who's arguably done most of the research uh, early on for biologics and regenerative medicine and plastics, as well as some key financial advisors uh, and my partner and co-founder, Dr. Ahmed Fadil Matwali. How do we operate and manage the lab? Uh, we've been fortunate to forge a, a relationship with James Seacrest, who's been a pivotal figure in the life science community in West Michigan for years now. And we've been very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Yoon, who essentially runs our facility in Kalamazoo end to end and, uh, you know, day to day uh, producing very high experimental quality results. We recently expanded in January. Uh, to Chicago. My partner and co-founder is the Director of Computational Oncology at the University of Chicago, and we have growing collaborations with Northwestern, Rush, and U Chicago Cancer Center. <clears throat> we just expanded to some additional wet lab space in Chicago's West Loop at Portal Innovations. And I'm going to lock it up there. I have some additional addendums. We're here at AACR in Orlando to present several, several publications. Uh, and this is really a banner year for us. So very excited to be on the call today uh, and get feedback because oftentimes as a part of these types of, of presentations, we, we don't always get feedback. So very much looking forward to that aspect of, of today. Outstanding. Thank you, Adam. Really great presentation. I found it very interesting. We are going to lead off with Diane and see what Diane's thoughts are. Go ahead. You're still muted. Do you want me to go on to Hugo? Yep, you're still muted. Okay, is that better? Now we hear you. Yes, go ahead. Ooh. I'm gonna restart the timer. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. You're okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, oh, I'm echoing terribly on my end. I'm sorry. Can you, Not bad. It's okay, okay over okay. here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, It's. it seemed to me like it was sort of uh, like you're burying the lead in terms of what this is used for. By the time you get through the whole explanation of the nanoparticle development and, and all, all of that, it took a, quite a long time for me to really realize that you're talking about using about this in the um, aesthetics market and cosmetics and so forth. So I think it would be helpful to know that a little bit earlier on. And then also, it would be good to see, since you mentioned that you're at uh, break even or profitable now, what your, your path has been in terms of revenue growth and how you're seeing that move forward. Yeah, thank you so much for the feedback. I think, you know, because um, we're a platform and we have some ongoing licensing discussions with some ma major immuno oncology uh, biopharmas and also our aesthetics deal, um, is not publicized due to some uh, contractual specifics. It's really like considering the audience for us. So <clears throat> look, I have nine, 90,000 ways to spin it, right? And oftentimes simplification is usually the best message. So your feedback's very helpful. You're muted, Sandra. I'm, I'm assuming you're telling me. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, I was telling Diane, thank you. Is that all? And then and then heading over to you, Hugo. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so Adam, I, I thought it was actually an outstanding presentation. Um, and uh, I, I think actually kind of a twist on what Diane just said. Um, it seemed to me like it was more like a 15 or 20 minute presentation pushed into 10. And uh, the content, I, it seemed to me was all there. It was a little challenging for us because it went by pretty quickly. Um, but I do think you hit really the key things I would want to see. Um, the only, this most significant feedback I would say is I, I kind of quickly caught, you didn't say it, but you might be raising a large financing later this year. Um, 
And so I don't know if uh, that's you know who you're presenting to eventually with this presentation, but uh, a little more um, articulation of what does the next couple of years look like um, from a you know we intend to generate X percentage of our revenue from license deals. These license deals have you know or the one that you currently have or hope to get has an upfront payment and then royalties or it's a three step pay you know how, how do you see over the next two three years just the big picture and i know you don't know a lot of you know you have to negotiate every deal there's a wide variety of possibilities um but just to articulate a little bit about hey here's the range of possibilities that we're looking at 100 uh, percent and you know, great feedback and I think because, you know, look, I've had to do this in six minutes before, you know, so you get really good at compartmentalizing things. But with that said, um, we have very, very uh, well baked out, you know, five year projections and they're all based on signed agreements. So, you know, I think as a startup, I think all of us probably on the call at some point, it's like ideas, ideas, ideas. Right. But there's a big difference between that and execution. So. I would welcome anyone or all to come into our, our data room, which has digitized introductions to each of these line items and offers just much more detailed uh, layers in terms of our commercial progress and, and back end progress. A oh, great job. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Hugo and Tim. We're going to have you give our last bit of feedback. First of all, uh, congratulations, Adam, on the great progress and what you've built. It's really exciting. Uh, my feedback is is pretty similar to Diane's. It was hard for me. I'm I'm not as familiar with this industry, so it was hard for me to fully get up to speed with what you were working on until you hit that cosmetic uh, slide. So, um, just a thought, but um, it might be easier to start with that. Um, as what problem are you solving for your current customers, and then kind of dive into like the broader vision for the platform uh, as you go on in the presentation. And so you're, you're kind of starting with a base basic level of understanding and then just showing people how this can get really big really quickly. Um, and then I agree also on the financial side of things too. I mean, being able to see that, that what you built is cash flow positive and what you're going out to raise is purely uh, growth capital and not survival capital. I think that that's going to be a, a powerful story as well. Um, but overall, I thought you did a great job. So thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, all of us, given the financial climate and uh, all the current events uh, for us, we are looking to raise north of 50 million uh, with a close in October. So, you know, candidly, a little transparency. I've only done six pitches and we've closed four. So I think just because you're still running the company, like finding the time to get the right introductions, the right meetings and do that the right way is on, for me the hardest part because we're busy with the day to day, right? In terms of the larger vision, um, people aren't gonna put that kind of money in until you can show them the dollars and cents, right? So we're still in like probably 75% of the way working with a manufacturing automation controls organization that's quarterbacking exactly what it's gonna cost um but thank you so much i, I mean it, it it is interesting over time you know where you feel like everything is falling apart every day but you hit a threshold at a certain point where you're like okay this is probably not going to fail anymore so it's 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 a good time for us and you know we just really need more exposure and more awareness and uh more opportunities like this so thanks for the feedback great uh, we do still have a few minutes left was were there any more comments or questions from the panel Absolutely. I, I'm curious, um, and I thought you said you were raising two million now and you have half of that. And then you're also saying you're going to raise another round at the end of this year. Is am I did I get that correct? That's correct. So we currently have I don't know if I would just call it proof of concept manufacturing in Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo. We can produce with a robotic viling um, and you know current infrastructure about 2,000 units a day um, of our products. Uh, with that said, um, we are looking to build our own facility in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and contract manufacturing cell and gene therapy with our platform impetus. So we're looking to do that um, in Q1 of next year with our close. Uh, our larger close in October, November of this year. 
So in terms of, you know, the, the presentation definitely needs to outline in a much better way. These are the milestones that are getting us there, you know, with our skincare deal and back end royalties and upfront capital, but also uh, with our product and the distribution agreements we've signed and the milestones that we're going to hit and achieve to get there. Um, this is a newer market. A Korean company came on in about 2017 and there's about no sales along with my former company and it went from zero to about 300 million in just a couple of years. So tons of opportunity and not very many companies. <clears throat> okay, any any other feedback from our panel? Because we do still have a couple minutes. Then I'm going to give an opportunity to Adam. Was there anything in particular that you wanted feedback on? Any specific questions you have for the panel? Um, no, I think, look, our, our like, hardest part is kind of demist like making things as simple as possible because we have big goals and big visions and big things but at the end of the day it's like how are you actually going to practically get there so my you know the most important feedback for me is the perception of what i'm presenting and you know how that's received in the minds of potential or current investors because um we've spent so much time and there's so many iterations of the materials you know, there's a point there where like you're not sure if the materials are ready and then you start showing them. You're like, wow, these are really good. And so you just, you know, it's an evolution for us. But I think because uh, we've spent the most time on the data room for us, it's like getting the interest level going to get access to the jewels. And then once, you know, you can look at the jewels, it's what kind of stone do you want and how do you want to be involved? I hope so. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Fascinating presentation. And thank you, panel, for the great feedback. We have one more presenter today. So, um, Joseph, if you are ready to pull up your slides. I am. Can you hear me, Sandra? And I can hear you. We don't see your slides yet, so let's give you a no, moment. All right. Let's see if I can get going. And congratulations, Adam and uh, Bob. That was awesome all together. And, uh, you know, I'm going to share something completely different. We're going to go to the <laughs> Um, to the outdoors, if you will. So we're definitely not um, um, biomedical by any means, but where I'm from, Sweden, you know, you can actually pres prescribe going to the outdoors as, as medicine. So to some extent, I, you know, I, I might be, if you will. Uh, <laughs> can you see my site? Um, okay, now we've got it. Yep, we're there and I can hear you and I'm gonna mute myself and whenever you're ready, you can begin. All right, started my time here as well. So, so anyhow, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so much again for the opportunity to present to you today. And uh, um, like Sandra said, my name is Josef Jomacher. I'm really excited to be representing the team at Electric Outdoors. We are a very early stage pre-seed, pre-revenue company uh, just getting going here. And uh, I have the pleasure of serving as the founder and CEO. And uh, we are on a mission, you know, a mission to bring people to wonderful remote places, uh, just like the one uh, that you see in the picture here. And we want to do that in a sustainable way. And um, I will come back to it later in the presentation, but we are not doing this alone. You know, we're not alone sharing this mission. And while not yet public, we will very soon be able to announce a grant that has been given us by the state of Michigan that will help us accelerate the deployment and the testing uh, of our initial product offering. And, you know, pretty much every day we hear about the next generation, the millennials and Gen Zers, how they are reinventing their way, you know, their way of traveling. Uh, they travel for personal wellness. They want to travel sustainably and, they, and stay at sustainable accommodations. And they travel for experiences. And these three along with a macro level uh, movement of mobility altogether, is uh, why we exist at Electric Outdoors. We are great supporter, uh, you know, supporters of this era of ever-growing electrification that we're in right now. You know, we certainly believe that this is a means to repair some of the damage that we have done um, to this world. It does, however, prone some challenges to our target group. Um, imagine being an end consumer who owns or rents an RV, you know, likely to be a van and increasingly likely to be electric. You will quickly discover that finding a place to visit, to stay and to charge is going to be hard. 
Or imagine being a landowner who wants to support the influx of all these electric vehicles, but simply has no assets to do that in a sustainable or an affordable way. Well, that's where we step in. And our canopy, this off-grid solar power destination platforms, you know, platform allows you to travel to the remote outdoors electrically. It charges your vehicle, provides fresh water, takes care of your waste, and leaving you to create memories rather than worry about some of those pain points associated with camping in the outdoors. And some of the, some of the key technologies that are integrated into our product includes a 440 square feet high efficiency solar roof, a 100 kilowatt hour high voltage, high capacity, and potentially a renewable battery system, uh, integration, um, an incineration system for waste, and a cloud-based IoT backbone. And we're designing the canopy to also be easy to deliver and deploy so that we can support microgrid-related challenges like deploying a set of canopies at Burning Man, you know, and when done, pack them up and move to the next exciting place. And I have the privilege to do this together with my co-founder, Kurt Tivisen. Uh, it's like our individual 20, 25 years of experience at Tesla, Neo, Aptiv, and uh, now just recently together at Door Industries, the world's uh, largest RV OEM, uh, where we brought some pretty amazing all electric RVs to life. It's like our careers have been the perfect learning platform to do what we do right now, you know, bringing our passion to life through electric outdoors. And we're surrounded by a great team with a diverse set of experiences, supporting and complementing our skills all together. And not to talk about the amazing response that we have gotten from the players here in Michigan. You know, without these wonderful partners, and I will talk a little bit more about them later in the pitch, you know, without these partners supporting and backing us, Electric Outdoors would not be as successful as it is today. And for that, we're very thankful. So turning um, to more business-related topics, I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of some of the staggering data surrounding sustainable travels. In 2022, more than 80 million American households went camping, and that's a number that I expected to continue to grow a lot in 2023. And out of those 80 million, 7.2 million were first-time campers. Millennials and Gen Zers now represent the largest growing demographic pursuing camping and outdoor recreation. 75% of those are interested in what we call glamping experience, so more high-end and 80% of, of them desire sustainable accommodations. And in the bottom corner, if you will, a favorite of mine, the America's 150 million youth, the nation's future, who fully embrace mobility and will be traveling around in electric RVs, remotely learning, working, schooling, and simply enjoy the experience uh, of being mobile. And built on this data, you know, we are operating within a pretty large target market space summing it down to you know, the obtainable market um, that we are addressing being the glamping space. It's a close to $3 billion market with a CAGR of 13.6%. Our go-to-market philosophy, well, it's built um, on our Michigan strategic partnerships and to launch state-of-the-art projects and experiences before we scale. It's very important to us that we deliver to the promise uh, so we want to ensure that we learn and control the experience before we scale, scale that will happen in 2025. And we will do projects, you know, together with our partners, like the world's first point-to-point -point or canopy-to-canopy -canopy all electric touring adventure in the Upper Peninsula, or, you know, the first ever self-sustained campsite, you know, in maybe uh, collaboration with the uh, DNR here in Michigan. And as they are sort of headline product, you know, projects in themselves, using them and built on a smart digital marketing strategy, along with, you know, the right social media influencers and channels, uh, it will be a joyful experience to go to market with these products. And through our partnership and personal relationships, we're already building up a customer funnel and product interest lined up for uh, the future scale. And our business model uh, is a well-established B2B revenue sales model uh, with some D2C recurring revenue um, through its digital resources. 
Uh, we anticipate a sales price of the EO canopy to be around $200,000 uh, and our apps to generate a significant amount, amount of money through subscriptions. Um, and it's also a model for realizing great benefits for the customer, uh, everything from deployment benefits uh, to tax in incentives, all enabled by the recent administration's uh, initiatives like the IRA and the uh, BIL. Yeah, and our financials uh, are based on a very conservative ramp up altogether. Um, we are uh, selling or we are uh, assuming to sell uh, cumulative 935 units by the end of our fourth year of full uh, operations, which is 2028, resulting in a revenue uh, just north of $200 million and more than $30 million of operating income. And why we think this is a very conservative model, um, it's sound and will enable the company to grow exponentially and at the same time expand its portfolio. And looking at our competitive advantage, um, a lot of recent activities bringing electric RVs to life, like the announcement of Lightship and Rollaway RVs. You know, these are great and boost the previous announcements of the traditional RV OEMs and auto OEMs bringing ERVs to life. But we remain unique in our solution, developing our purpose built destination platforms for these electric assets and executing on our vision and on the established timeline will give us a market first opportunity window and bring the infrastructure to life needed for these ERVs. And as mentioned, we have a very exciting journey ahead. We go out of stealth here, well, I guess now to some extent, but in April and May, uh, we will deploy and test and market our MVP in August at Chop House Park up in the Upper Peninsula. And then we are embarking on these very exciting projects I mentioned, from the world's first all-electric touring adventure to the first ever self-sustained campsite, and all in collaborations with actors here in Michigan, and all in the spirit of learning and controlling the experience before we, <clears throat> before we scale in 2025. And in parallel to this, we execute our funding strategy, consisting of a mix of non-diluted fundings with equity-based invest investments from strategic partners. And like I said, we're fortunate to have a grant being the foundation of our pre-seed round. You know, a very modest round uh, that we're hoping to close out in the next few weeks. And we are right now in detailed discussions with three investing par parties to match that, um, um, that grant. And they are very well complementing the core of the, uh, you know, electric outdoor partnership ecosystem altogether. But of course, you know, we're always interested to talk, uh, talk to additional investors and certain that we could find room for additional participation. And then a seed round will be executed later this summer, early fall, uh, target, targeting these two first experience and learning projects I mentioned earlier. And this round will be of a larger scale as it will also secure small volume manufacturing for the first year, uh, first years of scale. And core to our funding strategy is to work with a lead VC with strong Michigan ties and electric outdoor technology needs like battery management systems or strong sustain sustainable smart manufacturing. And in parallel, pursue these non-dilutive federal or state grants, you know, originating from the BIL or the IRA or other recent clean tech related action. So, Second to last slide, you know, again, we're, we're very proud of our traction, you know, primarily because we've been able to accomplish what we what we have based on the fantastic support and partnership uh, network that we have built, you know, OFME opening up doors on a state level, working with Centropolis, you know, doing the diligent R&D work, working with Shophouse Park, you know, for innovation, test and marketing activities and being part of the plug and play community, you know, with this network, and to the, you know, to the to be announced investors, uh, we feel very privileged and certain about successfully executing our vision. And a vision, you know, that does not end with the canopy. Uh, we are focused on the now, but we remain very strategic in our approach, eventually delivering what we believe will be the future of camping, you know, offering a full blown what we call trip in a box experience, all in the purpose, you know, all in a purpose built and flawlessly executed electric outdoors ecosystem. So with that, I think I will pause and um, look for feedback.
Okay, thank you. Hugo, we're gonna let you lead off. All right, well, thanks, very nice uh, presentation. Um, my, my first comment would be, um, I thought you did a very nice job of articulating the vision and the very high level um, kind of values and aspirations that the company has. Um, but I would say in the presentation of this link, it would be valuable to maybe cut that in half or so and spend more time on some of the very specific details. I think, I don't know if I'm the average person, but I, I would guess that the average person is looking at this and thinking, wow, that glamping, that seems expensive. It seems like a niche market. I think um, explaining why you think that there's a good financial opportunity, you know, kind of to counter that natural reaction people will have, I think would be valuable. Um, and, and I didn't fully understand, maybe I just missed parts of it, but I didn't understand exactly what the canopy would do. Like, would someone be able to drive their camper van there and charge their camper van up? Or is it really more for all their electronics and other things? Or, you know, what is, what's the sort of functional value um, that they'll get for whatever they're paying for this? Um, and then uh, thirdly, um, in terms of how this would be used, um, you both mentioned it being at a park and then being at maybe temporary things like Burning Man. Um, and so maybe the answer is both, but you know, who's the purchaser here and how does $200,000, you know, fit into what those potential buyers are doing currently? Um, and so I, I know that state parks, for example, have pretty darn limited budgets. Um, and so, you know, I don't know much about other, other aspects of who your customers would be, but kind of articulating how this would, you know, potentially fit into their budgets, I think would be valuable. Oh, that, that's fantastic feedback. Thank you so much, Hugo. And, and, you know, obviously in the time you have, you need to run through what you think will, you know, make sense with the, with the audience. There is a lot of things to, to, um, you know, to respond to your, um, to your feedback. Um, you know, it is a purpose-built, you know, platform that will do everything that you said, right? I mean, it will charge your electric vehicle or asset coming to these state parks. You know, it will take care of water. It will take care of waste. All, you know, very common anxiety, you know, anxiety and pain points when it comes to electrically camping or going to the outdoors. You know, so articulating that in a better way and making sure that sticks is something I will take to heart for sure. Um, we're designing it for off-grid purposes, right? So the thought is, and that's the discussion we have, we're having with national tribes, you know, like Hiawatha National Forest up in the Upper Peninsula or the Department of National Resources at the state level. While the, you know, while the canopy itself is a rather costly asset, there are so many incentives for it. So for example, a tribe or a vulnerable municipality will have about 70% of incentives to deploy an asset like these on their land, which will reduce the financial burden on the customer. The customer will be a state, you know, with its resources, a tribe, you know, because many of these locations that we go to to enjoy the outdoors are on, you know, these fortunate tribal lands and vulnerable areas um, um, of the outdoors, if you will. Um, customers will also be um, big, um, uh, let's say, uh, organization like Harvest Hosts, which facilitate uh, wineries, golf carts, uh, golf courses, uh, and breweries and stuff like that for people to come and rather than camp, you know, like a fish in a tight little box, you know, they will be able to have an exclusive experience, maybe be the only one or just the second one being on that facility, and they can, you know, charge and have the experience there all together. Yeah, just one more little piece of uh, feedback as well. Um, in terms of the revenue, you know, you mentioned both an upfront cost and then ongoing um, stream of revenue. Mentioning which of those is more important and how profitable you might expect them to be. Like, I have no idea what the cost of this thing is at two hundred thousand. So, um, you know, what the longer term primary financial value is. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Do me a favor and stop sharing because I think we're all seeing double of each other. Um, that'll make life a little easier. There we go. And we are going to jump over now to Jim and let you share your thoughts. 
Yeah, first of all, I thought the delivery of this was was really great. So so nice, nice work there. Uh, similar to Hugo, a lot of my questions were around the unit economics of, of this thing. So cost of goods sold, what the gross profit would be, um, and then how that scales over time. Um, just from my perspective, I would focus a little bit. I know you talked about a B2B and then a B2C option. I would focus more on, you know, what's the next 24 months look like? And almost the B2C is is an afterthought and you might even want to leave it out or just, you know, mention it in passing kind of thing. Because uh, it sounds like what you're primarily focused on is getting these canopies installed. Um, and then similar similar question on who the customer and purchaser is. And, um, you know, I think that tax incentive thing that you just mentioned is a big part of the story that I would try to work in. Yeah. Um, because if, if uh, a lot of what they're, Purchasing is going to be subsidized. That kind of changes the story for the better on your end. Uh, so I would definitely include that. Um, yeah, and I think well, overall that that was really my feedback. But I thought you did a nice job of presenting it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Diane, what are your thoughts? Well, I. Uh, I love the concept. This is very exciting. Um, I was a little uh, taken aback when we got toward the end of the presentation and you were showing sort of the, the illustration of what it would look like for these early uh, test locations, the Shop House Park and uh, the 10 units uh, that you're you're looking at uh, deploying versus what you showed in the beginning of the slides where it looked like it, it was already um, designed to be portable and with all the sections in it. Is it, am I interpreting this correctly that what's going into these initial sites, the four and the 10 is something that is more simplistic than what you showed at the beginning where it had all the different um, sections and, and all of that. The, the second illustration looked like it was just one kind of canopy with sort of basic functionality. So where oh, are well, you at the I guess? Yeah, no, that, that's great feedback. You know, so the first unit, the MVP that we will be, be deploying now with this pre-seed round and the grant that we soon will be able to announce um, uh, from, from Michigan, uh, will be uh, uh, obviously an MVP. It will not hold all the functionality, but it will demonstrate the aesthetically, you know, pleasing factor of the canopy because that's a big part of the value proposition. You come to somewhere where you can just enjoy, right? And just take in, you know, the environment altogether. But it will charge, it will have the solar roof, it will charge your vehicle, it will have the dig digital backbone, you know, to support all those aspects. And then backlogs would be water and waste. For the four units that we will be deploying also up in Shop, Shop House Park um, in the May, you know, springtime frame of 2024, our production intent. So they will have, you know, all the features um, embedded in them. Same, of course, with the 10 follow-on units that will be later that year, uh, you know, later that year, um, August, September timeframe. So will there ultimately be just one unit or will there be these different variations on it at different price points? Because so, 200,000 seems fine for the completely built out, but if it's just the canopy with the solar and, and charging your vehicle and stuff, um, 200,000 seems like a lot. Yeah, no, they will definitely hold all the functionality that we talked about. The beauty of this product is that while it is, it looks technical and complex in its nature, it's integrating existing technology, right? We're more of an integrated, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in terms of battery management system. It's more working with the right partners. And like I said, we have fantastic partners that will come in and have those assets, those technologies um, that can be made available for us. So charging, you know, the solar charging, the water and the waste and the digital background and the pleasing factors of the the patio, if you will, the cooking experience, the relaxing experience, the lightning, you know, those things, those will all be part of the four units, you know, starting in 2024. Uh, and just going back to, to um, Hugo's comment earlier, these will be flat bedded on, uh, you know, we're designing them to be easily and readily deployable. They will be flat bedded. 
um, uh, from our integration centers. You know, we're talking with the different smart zones about where should these integration centers be, where we can mount these uh, subcomponents, subsystems all together. They will be flat bedded on a low boy um, um, because that's where the height restrictions comes in, you know, from a regulation point of view. But we don't need any permits. We don't need any permits to place them on the grounds because there's no dig. You know, so they will be flat, flat bedded. Two people will be able to deploy and install them uh, rapidly in a couple of hours. Same thing, packing them up, back up on the flatbed, and then move on again. It sounds like what you're planning with these parks and stuff is that they would be set up and they would be there the entire season. And then you would maybe pack them up and, and store them during off season, something like that. So you're really designing them to be hardy enough to be up and existing in all kinds of weather for six, eight months at a time. Is, is that kind of the idea? Or are you thinking that people or parks will buy them and be putting them up as needed and taking them down a lot? Yeah, no, I mean, we def great question, Diane. And we, we have to design them. We are designing them for like winds to, you know, to sustain up to 150 miles per hour winds, you know, because of we're connected and we'll have weather forecasting. I mean, we're connected to, to um, weather systems that have 30 years of history data, you know, that we can read and learn. And we can also use the, the current weather forecasting to predict what's coming, right? So the unit can hunker up, if you will. It can fold itself up, you know, to, to, to brace for, for heavy weather, heavy storms and things like that. But long story short, you know, they're designed to sustain, you know, Michigan weather. That's what we're designing for, you know. And then um, 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 the, in, in terms of deployment and movability, I don't have a specific number, but I would estimate that about 90% of units will stay put where they are. And there will be, you know, a, a smaller fraction of our units altogether that will be, you know, part of a of an organization that supports, you know, different festivals and so forth, which is growing. So it could also be a growing part of our business plan. However, you know, if you were to ask me right now, about 90 percent will actually stay where they land the first time. Other than the ability of the. Um of the canopy to to charge your electric vehicle is there any reason why this wouldn't be great for anybody with a gasoline based vehicle no i mean so we're designing it for we're designing it for the future of what we believe will be you know electric also when it comes to rving and we're seeing a lot of things doing that and i actually started it myself when i was at thor industries but we definitely can host legacy rvs I mean, like an Airstream with a growing size of battery packs that need some extra juice, right? And anyone can come up and show up at these facilities for sure. Uh, but we're designing, you know, keeping that Tesla-esque experience in mind, if you will, where you need a great product and a great infrastructure and a great digital backbone to just carry out the experience the way we want to have it. Okay. Wow, that was some really great conversation for that uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Joseph. So um, we are going to wrap this up and, and bring it on home. So the first thing I wanna do is say thank you to all of you, to our presenters for sharing their companies and to our panelists for sharing their feedback. It was all wonderful. I learned a lot today and thank you everyone for being part of this. I hope you'll join us again for our next KVT meeting, which will be on July 25th. It will also be from 9 to 1030, just like this one. As always, we will have three new companies and three different investors to be on part of our panel. You can register for it at our website on our calendar. I dropped it in the chat, so do feel free to check the chat. Click the link and it will take you to our calendar. You can register for the next one. Um, again, thank you all for your participation and attendance. I'm going to stop the recording now and say have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.